Hey everybody, and welcome to Space Week for Monday, October 28th, 2019. There weren't any orbital launches last week, but there was an attempted launch of the fourth Exos Sarge suborbital research rocket, also called a sounding rocket. Sounding rockets have been used since the early days of rocketry in the 1940s and 50s to conduct scientific research in the upper atmosphere or in low space. They follow a parabolic ballistic trajectory, only allowing up to a few minutes of data gathering. Unfortunately for the Sarge 4, something went wrong shortly after launch, and the rocket lost control, veering off course and gyrating wildly. The rocket broke apart, with a section of it crashing a short distance from the launch pad. The nose cone appeared to have successfully deployed its parachute. Nothing in aerospace exists in a vacuum. Pun intended. I can't wait for the trolls to latch onto that quote. And I often find it fascinating to take a look back at where the systems and companies came from. Exos Aerospace was formed in 2014, essentially rising from the ashes of Armadillo Aerospace, a pet project of John Carmack, the co-founder of id Software and lead programmer of such iconic computer games as Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake. There's a long history of tech millionaires dabbling with rockets. Created back in 2000, Armadillo competed for the Ansari X Prize, Wirefly X Prize, and Lockheed's Lunar Lander Challenge. In 2010, they developed the Stig rocket, named after the anonymous race car driver in the British TV show Top Gear, and apparent twin of SpaceX's Starman. In 2013, the crash of their Stig B rocket prompted Carmack to put the company in hibernation mode while he looked for outside investors to, quote, restart work on the company's rockets. In 2015, Armadillo Aerospace's assets were sold to Exos Aerospace, which already employed most of Armadillo's former employees. The full name of Exos's Sarge SLRV rocket is longer than the vehicle itself. The Suborbital Autonomous Rocket with Guidance Suborbital Reusable Launch Vehicle. Based on Armadillo's ill-fated Stig B design, it uses a LOX ethanol propulsion module that generates 5,500 pounds of thrust and helium cold gas thrusters for attitude control. The rocket is just 20 inches in diameter and 36 feet tall. It's reusable in that it's designed to parachute back to the ground, though it doesn't land propulsively like the Falcon 9 or New Shepard. Like its predecessor, the Stig B, Sarge hasn't had an easy road. During the first launch in 2018, a malfunction in the GPS receiver caused the flight to be terminated prematurely, only reaching 28 kilometers instead of the planned 80 kilometer altitude. During the second launch in March 2019, called Mission 1 because it was the first reuse of the same rocket, High winds caused it to reach only 20 kilometers high. The third launch in June failed seconds after liftoff due to loss of control, similar to last week's launch. Responding to a condolatory tweet yesterday, Exos stated, Thank you, we don't quit. Indeed not. Sarge was launched from the controversial $200 million Spaceport America complex near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Conceptualized in 1990, construction of the spaceport finally began in 2006 with the help of a commitment by Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic. Finally, in 2011, the spaceport was officially declared open, though the interior of the building wasn't completed by Virgin Galactic until August of 2019. The expensive facility remains largely unused, due in part to delays with Virgin Galactic. In 2014, Virgin Galactic's first Spaceship 2 space plane, VSS Enterprise, broke up in flight and crashed during a test flight over the Mojave Desert, killing the co-pilot and seriously injuring the pilot. An NTSB investigation concluded that co-pilot Michael Alsbury prematurely activated the air brake device used for atmospheric re-entry. Inadequate design safeguards, poor pilot training, and insufficient FAA oversight were also cited. This month, Virgin Galactic unveiled the world's first exclusive spaceware system for private astronauts, designed by Under Armour. Not to be outdone, NASA unveiled their Artemis spacesuit designs, both the launch and re-entry suit, and the EVA suit, which will be used on the moon. It may not be much to look at, but it's much more technologically advanced, allows greater range of movement, 
and is easier to put on and take off than the current extravehicular mobility units or the Apollo space suits of the last century. No, dead gummit. Well, hey, team, would you have? Would, would you go over and help twinkle toes, please? The astronaut enters the Artemis suit from the back. It's actually designed so that the suit can be stored outside on the surface of the moon, with just the open back exposed to a pressurized landing craft or facility. That will help control the problem of lunar dust, which is the consistency of baby powder and gets everywhere. The Air Force's X-37B Unmanned Orbital Test Vehicle, aka Mini Shuttle, landed at Kennedy Space Center early Sunday morning, after a record 780 days in orbit. It carried Air Force Research Laboratory and other experiments, as well as providing a ride for small satellites. One of the experiments was the second Advanced Structurally Embedded Thermal Spreader, or ASETS-2. It measured the long-term performance of an oscillating heat pipe in orbit, which is able to dissipate more than 40 times more heat than regular copper heat pipes. The big event this past week was the 70th International Astronautical Congress in Washington, D.C., where government and industry players from around the world gathered to discuss the progress and future of space. NASA experts talked about the upcoming Clipper mission to study Jupiter's moon Europa. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine talked about our path forward to the moon and Mars. A panel of veteran astronauts and cosmonaut talked about their experiences and passion for space. Videos of all three of these IAC events can be seen on raw space. Also during the IAC, Blue Origin announced a national team for NASA's Artemis Human Landing System. Blue Origin will be the prime contractor, leading program management and systems engineering, and providing the descent element with their Blue Moon Lander. Lockheed Martin will develop the reusable ascent element vehicle and lead crewed flight ops and training. Northrop Grumman will provide the transfer element vehicle that will bring the landing system down toward the moon. Draper, maker of the original Apollo guidance computer, will provide descent guidance and flight avionics. Interestingly, while Lockheed, Blue Origin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, ULA, and other recognizable names are on the list of sponsors, SpaceX is nowhere to be found. Speaking of SpaceX, last week I said that they might be doing a test flight of Starship on Saturday. Obviously that didn't happen. Based on road closure filings with Cameron County, Texas, SpaceX's new date for the Starship test flight is November 2nd, with backup dates of the 3rd and 4th. There's another road closure scheduled for November 7th, with backup dates of the 8th and 12th. It's unclear whether that will be a second test flight or another set of backup dates for the first test. Whenever the launch happens, expect to see it streamed here on Raw Space. Looking ahead, we have a few events to look forward to in the coming week. On October 31st, Halloween, at around 10.23 p.m. Eastern, 2.23 a.m. GMT on November 1st, the moon will pass just 1 degree 18 minutes to the north of Jupiter. That's about two and a half moon widths. They'll be too far separated to fit in the view of a telescope, but they'll be great for naked eye viewing if the clouds don't get in your way. On Friday, November 1st, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. GMT, Japan's HTV-8 Kuonotori cargo spacecraft will depart the ISS, bound for a fiery re-entry over the ocean. On Saturday, November 2nd, at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. GMT, a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket will launch a Cygnus cargo craft to the ISS. Also on the 2nd is a possible SpaceX Starship flight test. The roads will be closed from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. GMT, so the test could happen any time within that window. Bear in mind that for many regions, including mine, daylight savings time ends in the wee hours of Sunday, November 2nd, and clocks will roll back an hour. Spring ahead, fall behind. Eastern daylight time will become Eastern Standard Time, and will be five hours behind GMT rather than just four. If SpaceX doesn't manage to launch on the 2nd, remember that the 3rd and the 4th are their backup dates. The launch window is the same time here in the States, 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern, but because of daylight savings ending, the GMT times are now from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. On Monday the 4th, before next week's episode of Space Week premieres, coverage of the arrival of the Cygnus cargo craft at the space station begins at 4.15 a.m. Eastern, 9.15 GMT. Also possibly on the 4th is a pad abort test of Boeing Starliner, that company's equivalent to SpaceX's Crew Dragon. The test time is currently unknown. All of these events will be live-streamed on Raw Space, if at all possible, so stay tuned. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching, as always. Like, subscribe, and activate notifications if you don't want to miss anything. 
Discord, merch store, and Patreon links are all in the video description. See you next time.